Well, just about all of my siblings went into the convent or seminary. We, I grew up on a mink farm, and we used to say that there were two careers that were acceptable in my family. One was to be a mink farmer, and none of us wanted to be a mink farmer. And if you want to get into that story, I'd be happy to share with you why you wouldn't want to be a mink farmer. So uh, virtually six out of my seven siblings all went to the convent or seminary. I was uh, second last. So my, my oldest brother became a priest. My oldest sister is still a nun. My oldest brother deceased. My oldest sister is still a nun. The other sister a, was a cloistered Carmelite nun. The other brother went to seminary for four years. The other brother went to seminary for two years. My other brother virtually went to a seminary. It was a, it was a Jesuit uh, boarding school in Campion, Wisconsin, which is just like a seminary. And then there was me. And actually, I think by that point, my parents were thinking like, no, we don't want all of our kids to go to the seminary. We want one to just stay home and go to high school like a normal high school uh, kid. So there wasn't necessarily pressure on me to go to the convent or seminary, but there, my dad somehow thought that I was going to be the son that would run the mink business. And, you know, I'm not quite sure why, that, why he would think that. I mean, I was a bit of a hippie and an alternative lifestyle guy. And... Uh, but he thought I had the eye and the ability to raise and uh, raise great mink like he did, and I just um, wasn't sure about that. So as I was doing theater at the time, I would come home during college and help him with grading and breeding and pelting, and I actually took a semester off to be a full-time minker, and I thought, man, this just isn't my scene. So, you know, what does a kid do who doesn't want to become a nun or a priest but grows up in the most Catholic family in the world? Uh, so, uh, I guess ostensibly I was the inevitable black sheep that all families seem to have. And um, so I had to do it their way, my way, you know, it's sort of the code of all black sheep. Like, I hate you. I don't want to be like you. I'm going to be different than you. And uh, so after college, I ran off to North Africa and studied Islamic uh, mysticism called Sufism sort of blew my poor dad's mind when he found out about that because he was a go to church every single day and say the rosary every single night and and so did I right that's how I grew up I grew up doing that stuff so I just leaped into mysticism and I think I gave him a nervous breakdown and eventually I found my way back to Wisconsin and um, hey here I am talking to you in my youth or in my life, I've worked with about 250 nonprofits. And I worked as a management consultant. Um, and I always say that I was a bit of a, you know, when you go to your internist, he has like two or 300 patients and he loves all of you, but they all have a different problem, right? This guy's overweight, this guy's high blood pressure, this guy, whatever, we all got a problem. So I loved all 250 of the nonprofits I worked with, but they all had a particular problem. So I was kind of a nonprofit internist. And my job was to sort of figure out where they were struggling and then help fix them. So that's just the background I come from. So inevitably, I, I help a number of groups in Milwaukee uh, through volunteer work. I'm working with Mesmer, uh, who does a great job. Um, I'm in a, offering some time to St. Marcus. And these are schools that principally work with minority communities. Um, uh, my brother, Leo Reese, uh, I call him the patron saint of affordable housing in Milwaukee. He ran Local Initiative Support Corporation for 10 years. I mean, I'm never going to measure up to Leo's ability to support the inner city. So I'm just, I just live in his reflected glory and tell people when I meet them, oh, I'm Leo Reese's brother. And then I get all these like cool points because I'm Leo's brother. But that's the guy who's really changing uh, the quality of our community and building safer neighborhoods and continues to do it. So I don't know <clears throat> necessarily if I'm doing a lot with our inner city, but what I'm hoping to happen through the Enlightened Gestures group and certainly through the commons and the, the work that we're doing, and I'll just say, you know, that in the, in the commons and the 300 college students we've worked with so far, about 40% of them are women, I think about 15 to 20% are minorities, and I'd ask anybody to touch those numbers in terms of, of startup education, in terms of entrepreneurship education. I mean, I gotta tell you, this startups, technology is the bastion of testosterone and white guys, that's it. When I go to these things, I, I look for a woman to be there, or I look for a minority to be there. It's just, I'm not seeing them there, but for our first class with the Commons, we had 140 students, and when I walked into that room, I said to my friend Peter Gunder, I said, take a look at this, and he said, what? I said, half of the people here are women. 
I mean, they're women. And when you look at, uh, I think, 1% of all the uh, people working for VCs are women. I think 4% of all, I mean, it's just a re ridiculous numbers when it comes to not just racial um, um, I issues, but gender issues around technology and startups. It's still kind of, it's uh, boys at play. I mean, it's, what, there's, something's gotta be wrong with it. Something is wrong with that, right? Somehow we're not getting ideas to the table because they don't reflect uh, uh, gender, I mean, broad gender, and they don't always reflect race. So you're not getting all of that creative intellectual input that just comes out of different people's life um, experiences. And I don't think it's a function of only white guys create cool ideas. I'm just not buying that.